Hey, Galen. Yes, Sony. If you could add your own category to the Game Awards, what would it be? I think it would definitely be Best Controversy. Best Controversy? Yeah. Because, I mean, there's, like, gaming controversy all over the time. Although, I feel like if it was a category this year, it would just be either Blizzard or EA or Pokemon. And that was it. Those are the only three contenders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. You know, I'm surprised. That's not normally like you to do. I thought you were going to give a very genuine answer of, like, uh, best uh, innovative way of loot schluter. (laughs) <laughs> or so- something like that. I don't know. I don't know what you do in your life. <laughs> Best salad schluter of 2019. You can't rest <laughs> on your sh- salad schluter laurels, okay? <laughs> okay. So, what about you? What uh, what category would you want to introduce? Well, being the cynical pos that I am, I would probably say most embarrassing lie, or like biggest. A crybaby digging their heels in the ground figure in gaming. <laughs> Another one that I just thought of is I want to give out a award for most cameos within a video game itself, and it goes to just Norman Reedus. Like, not even Death Stranding or Hideo Kojima or anything. Specifically give it to Norman Reedus. Most living video game. Most walking video game. Oh. Yeah. Hello, my happy helpers and fortune cookies. Friends, thank you for joining us today on the Nintendo Everything Podcast, episode 5555. My name is Oni Dino, and with me I have an animal friend that hasn't been introduced in Animal Crossing Pocket Camp just yet. So it is my great pleasure to introduce him right now. He's a bear. He's a daddy. He's a daddy bear. It's Galen. (laughs) (laughs) that's your banjo impersonation it's totally different no my my banjo has more of a a yup to it so instead of like just going it's more like (laughs) wait i'm having deja vu we've done this before haven't we we I I've used the banjo voice before in the past. Just saying. Oh God, <laughs> episode fifty-five. Here it is. We're just recycling everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this week we're gonna make it a quick one. That's right, a quick one. He said in the beginning of this two-hour episode. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> what are we gonna be talking about? We're gonna talk about the Game Awards predictions because the announcements just came out, and we're gonna talk okay. a little bit about. Uh, pocket camp animal crossing pocket camp having a little bit of subscription service and then a controversy with it uh, of course <laughs> yeah what, what is a day in gaming without a bunch of whiny people Tr- trying to get in that uh that last minute entry for biggest gaming controversy of 2019 okay that's what we're going to be doing though is that we need to think up categories Heck yes <laughs> yeah we're going to have our own the the nintendo everything podcast Oni Dino and Galen Awards. We're going to give our own Onis and our own Galens out to people. Ah, I want an Oni. (laughs) You won't get one. You specifically won't get one. Can it just be a golden statue of you giving your oh no you don't face? (laughs) (laughs) It would be like finger wag and everything. There's a little motor that like wags your finger back and forth. (laughs) Yeah, it would be like one of those like dancing Santas or like those hula hoop skirts or not hula hoop, the grass skirt things that you put <laughs> on your car dash it, but it's just me being like it's just you want a bobblehead just going <laughs> yeah 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 just like Mm-mm. i love it i love it i want one <laughs> like this shit ain't logical Mm-mm. well that begs the question now what would a galen award be a galen award would be like just you know everyone's just doing a good job and we're we're all trying and like it's something super positive like what's what's her name on that show the american idol the paula uh, paula pa- lady paula abdul paula abdul yeah <laughs> straight up that's what it would be huh i don't think you got my reference no i did i'm just i'm trying to remember the name of the song now and it's like it's the called one straight she's... up i think is that 
Yeah. The, the one where she's dancing with a cat? Oh, that one? I don't know. I don't remember yeah. the music video by any means. It's like, it's on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> this makes for great radio. Ah, opposites attract. Okay. That's it. You're going to sing it or what are you going to do? No, no. I just wanted to call out that I knew it. <laughs> Come on, you got to break into it. We're, we talk about one 80s and 90s sensation once I'm sorry. Episode. I would sing it, but it ain't easy. It's a natural fact. Oh. <laughs> the problem is anything after that point goes to the family guy spoof that they did of it and just goes to peter as the cat saying and i'm dressed like a cat and i actually don't know the rest of the lyrics now that mm. show has ruined it for me yeah well that wouldn't be the first thing that family guy has ruined in pop culture right because you know this is 2019 and we're still talking about that show because <laughs> current trends <laughs> we are not talking about that this episode <laughs> We're talking about Game Awards and shit. What are we talking about? <laughs> I already said it. You weren't even oh. here for it. Wow. You're always not here for it at this time. At the last, like, five episodes, you've been distant. I, I was doing Google Foo in the background. <laughs> See, that's the thing. <laughs> I'm doing the head wag now. I'm going to give you an Oni. Yes. <laughs> you know what your Oni is for? Worst podcast co-host. Hey, you know what? Something to put on my shelf next to all of my Amiibos. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so, yes, we are going to be doing that sometime in December. We'll have our our award show. We yeah. have to come up with the categories first, though. If you guys have ideas for categories, write into us. Nintendo, everything, pod at gmail.com. Yeah, I've, I've already got a few, but I'm, I'm very excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. So before we get into it, we got to say we are a weekly show. Welcome all of our new listeners. Episodes go live every Sunday. If you happen to be in the States, it goes up bright and early on Sunday. We are on pretty much all the podcast platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, you name it, we're there. Please take a brief moment to rate us on your podcast listening platform of choice. It is the best way to support our show. Galen, what is it? That would be the iTunes reviews and the comment section. Or no. Do, do they do they do do they do iTunes comments? Because you can leave a comment on like the podcast, right? On iTunes. No, you can't leave comments on there, Gala, I've tried like four times in a row now. <laughs> I say it is the best way to support our show, and then I say, Galen, it is what, and you're supposed to say the best way to support our show, and you never do it. <laughs> Listeners are are looking forward every single week to hear if you're actually just gonna perform and you constantly let the listeners down i mean to let them down they would have to have expectations to begin with well that's the expectation the expectation is what i'm setting up for them <laughs> so you're telling me that this is a failure on your part for setting the expectations no high. it is a failure on your execution <laughs> so straight up now tell me do you really want to be on this podcast forever oh 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 jeez paula abdul is our number one fan on this podcast. <laughs> she, she left an iTunes review. Don't you want to be as good as Paula Abdul and leave an iTunes review for us? Well, she probably wasn't even like understanding what she was leaving a review on. She's like, you know, you guys, you're just, you're so full of magic and you know, you're just, you're doing your thing. <laughs> and mean, meanwhile, whatever that guy's name, Randy Newman or whatever his name is, he's like, it just wasn't for me, dog. The Nintendo Everything podcast is just not for me. Then <laughs> Simon Cowell comes along and is just like, you know what? I really liked it. Yeah. And then everyone's like, oh. yeah, I know. Everybody's super shocked. All right, let's move on. Let's get the show on the road. <laughs> so this is our adventure log segment where we talk about what games we've been playing this week. If you want to interact with me talking about games, come to my Twitter. That's at Oni underscore Dino. You can also check out my Instagram, that's Oni underscore underscore Dino. I've been uploading pictures of my adorable cat, Boo. And Aww. also I've been uploading a whole bunch of pictures of shirts. I've been digging out my, my closet lately, so I've been, you know, showing off some of the clothes that I have that I'm also going to be probably throwing away that are, like, 10 years old. Including this DJ Ozma t-shirt that I'm wearing. If any of you know DJ Ozma, bounce with me. Nope. Nope. No responses. Yeah, Galen doesn't know who <laughs> DJ Ozma is. I do not. I cannot bounce with you. 
<laughs> and then you can also see me playing video games with my husband on our casual YouTube called Game Married. That's G-A-Y-M-E Married on the tubes of you. <laughs> the tubes of you. Our content is not made for children. Yes, <laughs> it is. It is not family friendly. <laughs> anyway, Galen, what about you? Where's your socials? Well, if you guys ever want to reach out to me, you can always find me on Twitter at Mobius087. And you can also find my Instagram photos at True underscore Mobius. So, Galen, let me tell you about this game. And what game is this? I've been playing some more Atelier Ryza. Hmm, okay. Okay. Now, you've been playing this game for a little while now, so it's uh, it's still catching your attention, still getting you to want to play it uh, more and more? Yes, but I've not really been playing it for a little while. I played it initially when it came out, then I stopped for a minute because I was doing other things, and then now I just went back to it just to skosh this week. Koei Tecmo, you know, full disclosure to our audience, of course, Koei Tecmo sponsored our podcast the past four weeks, but this isn't a, a sponsored segment or anything like that. So, you know, don't worry, we'll always be super transparent whenever we have something like that going on. This and, is an honest Oni opinion. Well, they're always going to be honest opinions. I'm never going to, like, take a sponsorship that doesn't fit the show, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. We're not going to suddenly just be like, cow tail collagen for your face. <laughs> You would sponsor that. No, I wouldn't sponsor that. It doesn't work for our <laughs> listeners. I'm only going <laughs> to accept sponsorships that work for our listeners. A hashtag not spawn. Hashtag please spawn. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, Atelier Ryza, I'm really still having a great time with this game. It's just a, a fantastical adventure. Well, it's not super fantastical. It's grounded in a bit of reality initially. And you really do feel like you're just a child going out exploring the switch version really looks nice too like after being away from it and then going back to it I, i'm really appreciating just how pretty the game is it's got so much different lighting and visual effects during different times of day and i'm just so happy that the switch version looks great because i've seen some of the other atelier games on the switch before and they looked like updated vita versions and i was kind of like uh -uh. I don't know if I can look at this game for this long, you know what I mean? <laughs> this new entry in the Atelier series is really excellent. I'm wondering if it's because it wasn't on the Vita, so like the benchmark was Switch, you know? The story's moving at sort of a slower pace, but it's not a problem with me because there's always like forward momentum in the story, and mm -hmm. the interactions between the characters are great. I feel like every single scene is fleshing them out, fleshing out their personality or establishing them just even further. And I really enjoy being with these, so far, four characters that I have. Yeah. Now, after not playing it for the past couple of weeks, uh, how easy has it been for you to kind of like jump back into the story and the plot? Super easy. The game has really good menu systems where you can easily access what quests you've been doing, what's been going on in the story, what was just last said in whatever scene you were in, whether it was one of those like meaningless scenes of you know, character development, or whether it was a genuine story scene. Like, the UI is fantastic in the way that you can access all these different things. So I was caught up instantly. Hmm, okay. So this is a, a good game that you can put down for a bit, then come back to, and you don't feel lost or anything like that. Nice. Which I, is great I find for me. <laughs> that, yeah, I, I find that's a trap of a lot of, not only just RPGs, but just a lot of games in general nowadays is yeah. you kind of put it down, you walk away, you come back, and you're like, what the heck am I doing? What is, what's a Brogmire and why do I have to collect this fifth of seven items? Like, what, what is going on here? <laughs> that was really specific. You got a problem over there? What's going on? No, 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 no problem. No problem. <laughs> 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 on, a, on a slightly unrelated note, <laughs> I, I last Friday I ran a D and D campaign that we just started like one or two sessions ago, mm. and I found that I've started giving recaps of what happened in the next in the last one, just so everybody can like remember what they're actually in and what they're doing at the That's time. That's good. That's good, actually. Yeah, yeah. But do you start it off with last time on D and D? Uh, I've thought about it, actually. I know um, you I, have. I, <laughs> I knew it. Uh, I do actually have a very particular song that I play during the intro of whatever 
campaign that we're starting. So. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> I can just imagine you as the overzealous DM, like dressed in your costume, and you got like candles and stupid shit like hanging out around you, and you're like, "All right, guys, we're gonna listen to this song," and then like you have to watch my interpretive dance while we start off this campaign, and everyone's like sitting there with their hands in their head, and they're like, "All right, Galen, all right, fine." <laughs> Uh, ask my wife. You're not wrong. <laughs> uh, I, I did. It. I did get a uh, a light up Bluetooth speaker that has. Um, it, it's kind of cool because it has a an LCD wrapped around the entire thing in a tube shape, and when you play music, you can set different things to it. So there's like a uh, spectrogram that goes on, oh, or God, you love shows, that like, kind fireworks. of gadget stuff. Yeah, uh, but one of them is a fire, and uh, I switch over to that whenever they're, like, camping or anything, and I play this, like, ambient campfire noise that comes through the speakers when they're kind of, like, settling down and have some time to, like, RP with one another. Uh-huh, uh-huh. such a <laughs> nerd. <laughs> hey, I'm gonna own up to it, because you know what? It is a crap ton of fun. Yeah, so. yeah, I, I <laughs> should say that when i'm saying this like i know i give galen a hard time like all the time but i'm saying that in a very affectionate way because that sounds like a lot of fun Mm -hmm. i love creativity like that i think it's good galen in the in the session that they had last they were going through this haunted house and they met these two ghosts that were the ghosts of these children that had starved to death in the upper attic because their parents locked them away to keep them safe but then the parents died and the kids never got out of a locked room okay um and one of them like possessed one of the characters and had to like play off as like oh well now you have to include in your in your mannerisms that you are a scared little child or that you are a you know an obstinate child who you know starts to throw a fit if your way if you don't get your way but they actually picked up the remains of these children and managed to find like a secret dungeon in the basement uh, and when they actually decided that they were going to put the bones to rest in the crypts of the children. And there was this like emotional scene of the the children leaving the bodies that they were possessing and then coming to terms with, okay, what does it mean to pass on to the next to the next world? And just playing the music just right. And I don't care how corny it was. it was it was so satisfying to play that out and to see the reactions of like everybody around the table and it was a lot of fun (laughs) you're you're definitely like an emotional mushy gushy guy when it comes to things like that because you i think that that's good that that's fun that you like to explore those kinds of things but it's just so opposite of like me (laughs) that's uh, that's why i find it fascinating to hear you talking about this kind of stuff yeah i'm telling you you we we should play a game someday we should mm-hmm. not <laughs> or oh. should we oh man you got me there ah. <laughs> what, was that the reaction that you were hoping when you said that not <laughs> I, I wasn't hoping for any reaction <laughs> i live my own life i march to the own beat of my own grookey you're a busy man with busy plans stop it every wrong time you say it wrong always. i know and it's beautiful that it annoys you so much <laughs> no shut up it doesn't annoy me at all shut up Anyway, speaking of not annoying me, Atelier Riza, which you so generously interrupted. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I do want to say, okay, wait, no, this does annoy me, that there are a lot of systems (laughs) in the game. And it can be overwhelming for a new person to the series. Probably somebody who has played the series for a while. There's probably, you know, not a whole lot of new things being thrown in. So they're probably just like, oh, yeah, when are we going to unlock this thing? And when are we going to unlock that thing? Because they're looking forward to all this different stuff that you can layer on top. And for me, a brand new person to the series, it can be overwhelming. But thankfully, there isn't like a dire importance on these systems. And you can actually ignore them a lot or like do them like one by one, even though they're unlocked. Uh, Mm. You can do them one by one as your brain, you know, accepts them. Or you can do the autopilot synthesizing thing. And you'd be just fine, honestly, doing that throughout the whole game as long as you're gathering a bunch of stuff. But it's hard for me because I'm not a diehard fan for the series, but I still like to explore these systems because they are fun systems. 
Mm -hmm. So I'm still trying to find out my balance of like, how deep do I go into these and how you know much do I just play the game leisurely, beat the game and go on to my next one, you know? So kind of rehashing one of the questions that I had from before, when you came back to this after not playing it for a couple of weeks, yeah. did, did you have any problems on getting back into these systems? If they were already complicated when you were going into it, like fresh, were you able to remember them? Or was this a, like a Pokemon chart type thing of like, I know this is a thing, but I can't remember specifically what this creature is weak to. And mm, like, no, not really because the way that they're built, they're built really smart in that once you get them, once they like finally click with you, then they just make sense. And okay. you're like, Oh, okay. This is, this is easy now. Once your brain kind of understands the concept. So even though it's complicated, it is very intuitive at the same time. Yeah, I, I guess you could say so. So, okay. like, I guess what uh, some of the one of the biggest gameplay loops in the game is is that you go out to these areas and you fight enemies, gather materials, you destroy breakable objects in the world, and you gather materials, raw materials, and mm -hmm. depending on which gathering item you use to destroy which certain thing, you get a different yield. So. If you use a sickle on a palm tree, you'll get, you know, material A and B. But if you use a hammer on it, you'll get material Z and Y. Okay. And and so on and so forth. So all these different materials on all these different items, destroyable items in the world, get totally different kinds of materials. And then each material has its own, like, element value, its own quality rating, its own attributes that it has attached to it. And it's all, like, on a random generator depending on like where you're at. So then you bring all that stuff back to your atelier or your room, and then you synthesize stuff and you can create new weapons, new armor, new usable items in the game. So, you know, potions and bombs and stuff like that. And new items that your characters need to fulfill quests for. And okay. it's this really great gameplay loop that doesn't feel overwhelming but has a lot of steps to it that each step accomplishing it feels very satisfying like oh good i just did this if you're one of those people that really likes you know checking things off of a checklist you're gonna feel really good about this game okay okay i can i see where you're coming from on that one yeah there's a lot of things to learn about it but you can ignore it and focus on just one aspect of it until you understand that aspect and then move on to the ne next aspect and so on and so forth without any problem like the game has different uh difficulty settings and that game can be as difficult or as easy as you want to make it because you can just min max like crazy <laughs> so it's it's just totally up to you there's all these different ways that you can come at the the way the gameplay that the game throws at you okay so i know you have a couple of games kind of in the fire right now do you feel like you're going to be focusing on this one more than some of the other ones uh, in the foreseeable future it's hard to tell because this is definitely a game that i can play in bed right before i go to bed just because i want to play a game and wind down for an hour so it's going to be in my regular rotation but i don't think it's going to be in my like heavy rotation if that gotcha, makes sense gotcha gotcha yeah no that makes sense something like astral chain which i want to get back to that's going to be in my heavy rotation that's not something you can play in bed <laughs> <laughs> i mean you could but i just i can't <laughs> so galen speaking of hiding under the covers you've been playing more luigi's mansion 3 right yeah, not as much as I would have liked, but I've definitely made some progress on it. Um, Great. And so <laughs> I have also been playing Destiny Connect. No, I'm kidding, Galen. Tell me more. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been making some progress uh, in the hotel. I would say going up the hotel, but I'm actually in the basement floor now. So, <laughs> oh. yeah, it's weird because like... You're going down, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Down, down, down. Anyway... Um, no, let that awkward silence sit there. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just having a lot of fun with it. Uh, the the museum level that I just went through was very short and sweet, but I loved some, some of the mechanics that it had on there. Um, the boss fight was definitely had me... I love the boss fights in this game because each mm. one of them feels more like a puzzle that I need to solve more than it is like a test of direct skill yeah yeah awesome 
I think that's one of the beauties of this game because they give you all the abilities so early on and they don't have that progression system of you slowly get more things that make your character stronger. They can really elaborate on different ways to use your abilities and it becomes more of almost more challenging because you don't have that hint of, well, I just got this power up, so obviously the next boss I fight is going to be focusing primarily on this power up. Like, yeah, you don't have yeah. that case, so. That's the frustration that I have with, you know, classic Zelda is I, as satisfying as it is to be like, oh, I just got this power up and now I need to use it on the boss. Cool. Mm-hmm. I just did it. That was fun. It's like a little too short and sweet, you know? Exactly. Satisfying, but too short and sweet. So I like a good variety of maybe some of that. And then maybe also just like, hey, you have your tools, but what do you freaking do? Because it's not like you got something new and there's no hint. Exactly. Exactly. And it feels that much more rewarding when you actually do beat a boss boss. Uh-huh. Um, Because again, like there are a lot of mini bosses in this game. I would say that there are actually more mini bosses than there are regular enemies. It just feels incredibly rewarding every single time that you beat one of those because you you're figuring out that puzzle and you're like, yes, this is how you do it. And once they're like, hey, good job. Let's go ahead and, you know, give it to you. Is there one boss that you fought recently that you're like, ooh, this particular thing? Uh, the the museum boss that I just fought had a very obvious mechanic of uh I'm, the beginning part is kind of obvious, so I'll just say it. Uh, you okay. have to shoot something at him. So okay. there's something that in the in the surrounding area that you have to shoot. Well, I once you do that for the first time, he ends up blocking the shot. So you have to distract him with something else. And I could not for the life of me realize what it was that I need to do. Uh-huh. And then egad, he just randomly pops in with a, hey, you know what, let me give you a little hint, even though I totally did not ask for that. Oh. But when he was like, hey, maybe distract him, you know, when he like is referring to something, the game does that thing where it highlights it with a particular color or something like that to refer it. Like, it's giving it away while not actually giving it away. Is there a way to turn that stuff off, though? Uh, I don't know. I should probably look into the settings a little bit mm. more. I hope there is. Cause, but, I mean, when I realized what it was that the game wanted me to do, I was on the floor laughing because it was not something that I would have thought of just off the top of my head. Okay. So, <laughs> well, and I, I, I won't say it right... It. Yeah, I, I won't say it right now, but it, it's it's pretty fun. Okay. Um, I would love to do a spoiler cast of this game when it comes out because there's so many things I want to talk about. Because really? It, it, it is a great experience. It is okay. a really great experience. And I feel like, especially talking about this, I would love to go into more depth as to how you fight this particular boss and just how innovative the fight it was. But I can't at risk of like anybody who might be going through it, which includes you. Which begs the question, uh, I noticed that you have started playing this game on your Let's Play channel, uh, yes, Game Married. Yes. So I would love to hear your impressions of what you have seen in the game. Because you have <laughs> you have Cliff who's playing it right now, right? Cliff is playing it, yeah. Yes. Um, I haven't caught your latest episode just yet, but I believe you Why are. Why not? Because <laughs> I've had things to do, but it is in my watch later queue. <laughs> um. Uh, yeah, I do believe you guys are pretty close to getting uh, Guiji as a playable. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's when I'm going to start playing. Yeah. And it was actually fun. I brought my Switch over to my, uh, my in-laws place, and my wife's sister hasn't had a chance to play it herself, so she started playing, got to the point where she got Goichi and then one of her brothers jumped in. And that was the first time that I've really seen from an outside perspective, two people playing this game at the same time. And it was a lot of fun just watching them oh. like work together on this. So I'm, cool. I'm very excited for when you guys get to that point, but tell me your thoughts of the game of what you've seen. Sure. 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 So it is so gorgeous. It is right? really, really well right? animated. <laughs> It's gorgeous from like such a wonderful animation standpoint. It's really cool how there's so many different items in the world that can just be blown around. Like in the other games, there weren't so many of those. There were some, Mm -hmm. 
but this one just has so many different objects that have their full physics. The the physics in this game is insane with just how many things, when you look at it from a technical level, just how many things you actually can interact with uh-huh. and how many things that you have, it has to be programmed in there that you can interact with. Yeah. Uh, it's very impressive. I really enjoy the aesthetic, of course. Like, it's just so Beetlejuice to me. <laughs> yeah, I definitely get I that. I love it so much. It's like the weird Tim Burton something is slightly off. I really enjoy Madame Gravely. Is that her name? Mm-hmm. I really enjoy her voice. And, like, I can't stop thinking about it where she's she's not really saying real words, but she's like, a summon a shura. <laughs> you know? <laughs> a sashwava. <laughs> it's just... Like I think I said on the on the show, I said it was like a mixture of like Russian and Chinese and French or something like that. Yeah, I'm also enjoying <laughs> saying uh, certain very crude things that I wouldn't normally say on this podcast on the show, <laughs> especially about the the Toad's party habits. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. <laughs> First off, I love the reference that you threw out in the show. Um, this is second, uh, when I was at the in-laws yesterday and uh, my wife's sister, Clara, was playing, uh, she made the joke of, you know, that Guiji, he has a bit of sentience about him. Do you think he can feel love? And I immediately turned around and said, no, don't go down this path. This is, bad. <laughs> this is a bad journey to go on to. Um, th- that is very much your wife's sister. <laughs> this is a dark avenue that you cannot close those doors of DVR. Okay, Guiji can go into pipes. We don't want to go down the routes. Guiji is coffee flavored. You know that? Oh, what? Yeah, Why is one that of the canon? developers said that, or maybe it was maybe it was Miyamoto or somebody said that that oh, he's probably coffee flavored. <laughs> coffee flavored gelatin. That sentient in your mouth like t- if he takes a bite of him you just like oh geez this is going into vor territory <laughs> we can't we can't with this shut it down turn it yeah. off <laughs> so that's the disturbing world of luigi's mansion 3 mm-hmm. for for the record i have been thoroughly enjoying this game I feel like you are enjoying it from playing it, and I look forward to seeing more of you guys play this one. Yes, yes. When we started playing it, uh, Cliff didn't realize, but he was very sleepy. He didn't realize until he started playing it, because he hasn't played a Luigi's Mansion game before, and so he's like trying to understand the controls and kind of the, the concept of the game, because he's never played mm-hmm. a game like this. And then that's when he was like, oh shit, I'm sleepy. <laughs> so the next few episodes are going to be much more... Uh, exciting and I also felt bad because I was like okay you don't just always suck the vacuum you know <laughs> like he was just kind of standing there and <laughs> sucking at nothing and I was trying to be like we have to move this playthrough along you know <laughs> well and that's the thing like the first time you're playing the game you just want to you're so enamored by what the physics can actually interact with that you do just want to walk around and like just take the vacuum to everything so we'll be talking about this more in the future then just to top things off, wanted to mention that I beat Destiny Connect this week. Oh, congrats. Thank you. I, I did a good job. Good job. I was actually very close to the end last week. So when I started playing it this week, I was like, oh, I'm really close. So I beat it like right away. And I really enjoyed my time with that game. There are some things that I wish were so different about it, though. Okay. What? Like what? <laughs> so, uh, the way you said that, I don't know, it's fun, funny about it, something that words jumble. Salad. Word salad? Is that what you wanted to say? <laughs> woof, woof. So, I feel like the game would really have benefited from being shorter. The entire game feels kind of like a light version of what the game could have been. For example, none of the characters had character arcs, really, but they were all charming characters that you understood. I feel like a lot of things could have been just a little more diverse or had more creativity or been a little more fleshed out, but some things could have been way shorter. I feel like maybe the last quarter of the game felt like padding, 
and it should have been just like a short final hurdle that feels good to get over in anticipation for the final battle and everything and the story conclusion. Okay. Uh, when I got to the end, I was definitely like, oh man, I just want this part to be over, you know? <laughs> Which so is not a great feeling to give your players. Yeah, the, the pacing was a little off near the end. It just needed to be shorter. And there was a couple of times where I was like, oh, is this quest really, you know, necessary? There was some interesting word world building stuff in the game but i don't know there was also a few loose ends that didn't get tied up i mean not not a few just like one or two here or there that i just felt like was a bit of an oversight and i was like what what mm. so does the game have multiple playthroughs and abilities to like go back and like make changes to possibly fill up those loose ends no no not at all <laughs> uh, this this is a one and done kind of game for sure <laughs> it was fun and it was really pretty the art direction the animations the sound design all fantastic like way better than it had any any worth being so that's okay. why it was frustrating when those things were so high quality and then other things were just kind of like uh, a little underbaked or they went in the wrong direction with it. And I would like to talk a little bit about the story, but I don't want to spoil it for anybody that is interested in playing it. If you're you know, interested, I do still recommend this game for sure. Okay. So it was still worth the overall experience. Yeah, yeah. I would just say to kind of run past enemies if you feel a little tired. Because that's the other thing is that some of the gameplay is just running through town or dungeons or something that, something like that and fighting enemies and then doing a couple puzzles here or there. And those were nice, but I feel like they could have varied the gameplay just a little bit more because by that last third, it was starting to feel like, eh, same, same, same. You, you've had your fill and you're, you're ready to wrap this up. Yeah, yeah. The story was really cute, though, and that's what, you know, kept me going. Mm-hmm. So, still a recommendation from the Oni Dino. Good. Well, I'm very glad that you were able to finish it, and overall, I'm very glad that you had a good experience with the game. Yeah. Because you've been talking about this one for a while. Like, this had been Three on weeks. your radar since... Well, and even before then, like, you were talking about this game, like, at the beginning of the year, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that is true. Because of the art style, I was just like, whoa... Uh, this looks so cute and like i knew it was a jrpg that was very inspired by 90s jrpgs and there was time travel and i was like mm -hmm. ah, speaking my language <laughs> i don't know what that voice was i'm sorry it was perfect it was like semi miss piggy <laughs> all i needed to do was punctuate it with a Hiya! <laughs> perfect <laughs> so if anybody else is playing the game, do interact with me on the Twitter. I would love to talk to you about it and love to know how you're getting on with it as well. Yeah. So let's move on to the news. So not too much happened this week in the news, which is fine diddly iron with me. Why am I Flanders right now? <laughs> <laughs> Howdy ho. Howdy ho, dear neighbor. Wait, isn't that like the the guy on the other side of the fence in the home improvement? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I A Tim Allen, you are not. I hate that show. I, I hate know. everything in the world. I'm a cynical person. I it's an early '90s sitcom. I thought that would have been your jam. <laughs> no, I did watch it though. Early '90s sitcoms that are my jam: one, Third Rock from the Sun; two, The Nanny; three, Seinfeld. End of list. Four, Frasier. No. You were never a Frasier guy? Never. I was not a Frasier guy. I was not a Friends guy. Hmm. I watched right. a little bit of Cheers, which was all right. Well, okay. I love John Lithgow. <laughs> but anyway, video games. This is a video game podcast, you jerk. Yes. This week, we got the... What are these called? Nominees. Oh, thank you. We got the nominees for <laughs> the... <laughs> Game Awards. We're not going to read them all out because, wow, there's a bunch of categories and my eyes glaze over after I get past, like, the fourth category or whatever. Also, yeah. personally, I don't really watch the Game Awards. Do you really watch them, Galen? Uh, I've only started to watch them recently just because I want to get what the whole hype is. And sometimes they do have some actual announcements. I mean, last year we did yeah. get notice that Joker was coming on Smash Bros. So, Yeah, and th that's something I want to talk about, too. 
Uh, before we go into all of those kinds of things, let's talk about specifically the nominees just for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really watch these shows. I don't really care for award shows of any kind of media just because it's not my bag. I don't think that they are indicative. Well, they can be indicative, but I don't think that they're at all any kind of definitive statement on, oh, this game is, you know, great or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, money gets thrown around and, you know, it's not it's not an unbiased opinion on it. I mean, look mm -hmm. at... Okay, so we're going to talk about that. But, I mean, look at uh, Death Stranding, getting all these nominations in all these different categories. The one yeah. that really gets me... And I haven't played the game, so... And I'm not really interested in it. But I've heard some some really good opinions from people that I really respect their opinion of video games. And... From what I've heard, like, you know, the game is really fun and it's really good in a lot of different ways. The story is not the strongest. Mm -hmm. And in particular... Which, which is which is weird because it actually is up for nomination on Best Narrative. That's the thing. So Best Narrative kind of gets me. Best Score in particular really gets me for with yeah. Death Stranding getting the nomination. Because it's like, that game, from what I've heard, doesn't have much of a score, and not let, you know, ambient sounds and whatever can't be a score, or can't be, yeah, a score. But can't be there, considered, yeah. There is also Best Audio Design, and it's nominated in Best Audio Design as well. Yep. And from, I don't know, just, it just feels like, oh, this game's big, and also Jeff Keighley or Knightley, whatever the hell his name is, I can never remember, and Kojima are best homebros, so obviously you know mm -hmm. every single year at the game awards i think they've been, they've done something about kojima you know yeah my my thing about this is just it's it's such a weird place to put like a best of award into because just look at game of the year just look at game of the year we've got control which does anybody remember that game? I heard it was good, but not game of the year standards from what I was hearing. Yeah, from what I heard about that game, let's go one by one on the game of the year thing, because that's the big category, right? Yeah, yeah. So Control, from what I heard about it, it was on the PS4 and probably PC or something. It was like you play as some girl with like telekinetic powers. It's a third person yeah. action game, right? Mm -hmm. I heard it was very, very buggy, and I think that they did fix it. But that's kind of what I heard about it. I heard that it was solid but buggy. Yeah. I didn't think it was any kind of, I don't know, standout or something. But, I mean, whatever. Yeah. Like, again, we're not, personally, I'm not mm -hmm. talking about, like, the validity of the Game Awards and that it doesn't hit the Game Awards standard of whatever, like, because I don't believe in any of that crap. <laughs> but anyway, please, go on. Yeah, but going on, you know, Death Stranding makes an appearance for Game of the Year, which I find ironic because a lot of people were actually criticizing the game, thinking and calling it essentially a walking simulator. Yeah, I mean, people love to throw around that that uh, phrase, walking simulator, because they love to just like try and jab the knife in, like your game's not a game kind of thing. Mm -hmm. From what I've heard, like the gameplay is actually quite good. It's just a so different take on video games that you don't see in AAA games like this. And not that this is necessarily a AAA game. Like, what, what defines a AAA game, right? Is it the publishing team? Is it the development team? Is it the amount of money that's thrown in? You know what I mean? Yeah, so, exactly. Whatever. Um, this is I, a highly I, publicized game. I, I do want to call out Girlfriend Reviews because they recently did just do a review of this game. And uh -huh. it, in it, they actually make a really good point on how the game as a standard action game or however you want to perceive it it's all right it isn't the greatest but kojima was trying to do go beyond it in some sort of meta commentary about the sake of community within gaming and making a commentary on that and a lot of that is reflected in, yes, you're going out into this vast landscape, but the way that you can improve your travels can also improve travels for the other people who are playing. And it becomes this cumulative, you are not alone feeling throughout it. But what is his commentary on it? You know what I mean? Like, okay, fine, you're trying to do a meta thing and be subversive maybe, but cool, but that can't be it. Otherwise, that's just fluff. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then people who are like, oh, it's so heady and it's so amazing that he's doing this in a meta way. And it's like, I don't know. That's that's weird. It's like 
marveling at somebody for using chopsticks instead of a fork to eat something. It's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just a vessel. It, you yeah. have to actually have something that actually is substantial at the end of that. Yeah. And I I have not played this game personally myself. I'm probably going to rent <laughs> we it. We have to and... not say personally. I can't stand that. I, I've been saying it too. I can't gotcha. stand it. We have to <laughs> not. Otherwise, I will lose my mind. Gotcha. Well, me personally. I don't know. <laughs> I have not played this game myself, and I'm probably going to give it a rent before I give it a buy because I am interested in the concept of it, but it's very surprising to me that it is automatically achieving this Game of the Year nomination or mention. Yeah. But yeah, moving past Death Stranding and kind of going back down onto the list. No. Sorry. We're going to talk a little bit more about Death Stranding. I wanted to say that my only... My, my raised eyebrows, right? Because I don't know exactly what the game is about because I haven't played it for myself. But from what I've heard through a different lens, from a lens of another person, is that the writing is very bad in the game. They have some interesting concepts and they have a whole bunch of you know jargon in the game to call certain things certain things, like the BBs and the BTs, I think, and just some other mm-hmm. stuff and that it rains time and that's called a certain thing. But the big criticisms I've been hearing from a couple of people are that the exposition is just delivered to you in such a blase way with no like in world reaction to how certain things are this weird way. So for example, in the game, they have these things called still mothers and they are basically brain dead women who are kept alive to be impregnated, to give birth, to these babies and from there that's where my knowledge on it gets even hazier but uh, just that concept alone like that is a nightmare for that's like a a feminine nightmare beyond belief still not saying that they can't tackle that topic or something or that it's in poor taste or something but if that's what it is then there should be some sort of reaction to that in the game. When that concept was explained to the characters in the game by another character, it was just kind of as is. And there was nobody in the game to sort of mirror the player and be like, whoa, that's super fucked up. Like, why is this happening? And something like that. You know what I mean? I I think, for example, in like horror movies, one of the best ways to write one character archetype in a horror movie is that they are the... Uh, the reflection of the audience, you know, like other characters can exist and be doing like stupid things or be doing smart things or be doing really weird things that you'd never think of because you have to move the story in certain ways. But there should always be that one character there. That's the reflection of the audience. That's like, whoa, what would I do in this situation or whatever? And I think that that element is missing from the storytelling in death stranding, just from what I'm hearing, you know, gotta, God, this is the internet. So you got to, friggin preface and punctuate everything you say with you know this is subjective or whatever yeah (laughs) Uh, i don't know kojima's never been a fantastic writer in my opinion he is great at concepts and really weird things and i love that and i love that death stranding exists and i love that the gameplay is weird and challenging like what is a experience with a game you know it's not spider-man ps4 exactly and I mean, most of my experience with Kojima games have been primarily from the Metal Gear series or Solid series. So, yeah. and those have been incredibly exposition heavy and incredibly uh, opinionated when it comes to making commentary and expressing, addressing certain issues and certain outlooks through the characters that they write in this game. Yeah, and something else that you have to remember about with like the Metal Gear Solid games too is that it was not just solely a Kojima effort as well. Not to say that like he didn't have help on the Death Stranding game, but like this is made by Kojima Productions, right? So Konami, you know, there were definitely other people involved. There were definitely producers and stuff involved. And that's kind of my thought, like going back to like Tetsuya Nomura, is when you have a creative person and then you have producers or people who... Mm, are sort of wrangling in that creativity and being like, okay, but no, we really need to think about timelines and we need to think about money. And sometimes their overbearance can ruin a creative project. And then other times, just the right amount of involvement is beneficial. 
because it needs to be a collaborative project when it's something huge like this, right? Like a big video game mm-hmm. like this. And I think that maybe that's what Kojima was missing with this. Somebody who proofread this game and wasn't just a bunch of yes men to Kojima about, well, it could use this. Like, okay, your concept is good, but your execution or your your storytelling is poor or whatever. Yeah. And I mean, we've seen that before in other other game creators who have gone mm-hmm. solo. Like, look at uh, Keiji Inafune. Yeah, yeah, th- that guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, hey, look, here's the the father of Mega Man, and he's branching out and creating this awesome game on Kickstarter. It's going to be fully funded, and it's going to be awesome. We're calling it Mighty Night <laughs> Number 9. <laughs> and then complete, yeah, like, what, what were you doing there? <laughs> Kamiya said it best. KG Inafune is a businessman, not a creator. Mm-hmm. I probably just screwed up that quote, but it was something like that. Whatever. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Don't 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 listen to my podcast anymore. <laughs> so, um I I definitely feel that this game is going to be interesting and I definitely hearing more about it now that after its initial launch has come out, some of the initial feedback and the shouting has kind of died down. It's mm. interesting to see what has kind of stuck through and i'm interested to give this game a try and find out what it is yeah yeah and other than you know my my raised eyebrows at the storytelling Mm -hmm. i think that what i've heard from a few people before is that everything else about it is interesting or amazing and i like that it is just not what you expect a triple a game to be in terms of gameplay and progression and everything like that i like that yeah so i'm glad that it's challenging i'm glad that this mm-hmm. game exists for sure no absolutely but that begs a question is it the game is a game of the year worthy whatever it's a game awards <laughs> whatever i don't care <laughs> i don't care well and l- let's go down at uh, the competitors that are also on yeah, here let's so keep going. Al- also on this list is super smash bros ultimate yes which was very surprising because this game came out like last year (laughs) it did but it came out after the cutoff for when it could be um... fiscal years and yeah yeah i get that i i was surprised to see this on the list um and also it's worth pointing out this is the only nintendo game that's on this game of the year list this year yeah which is surprising because nintendo's had a good year in terms of games that came out just none of them were like the super crazy triple a games but i mean Astral Chain, Dragon Quest, though that was, you know, a definitive edition. Mm-hmm. Fire Emblem. Fire Emblem especially. Like, I'm really surprised that game is not on this list. Yes, that's on my talking point list. I think that Fire Emblem got <laughs> snubbed. It's only in, like, strategy game, and it's like, there's so many good things about this game. This is one of the best Fire Emblem games, and personally, my favorite Fire Emblem game that I've experienced. Mm-hmm. Ah. Anyway, go on, go on. If it's Smash yeah. Bros. Ultimate. So Smash Bros. Ultimate's on this list. Um, another one that's on this list is Resident Evil 2, uh-huh. which I'm actually okay with this game being on here. Like, this game was amazing when I was playing through it, and it it did everything that I wanted the game to do as far as building upon itself and surpassing its own expectations. Yeah, for me, I'm glad this game is on the list because I want... Capcom to keep going in this direction of making yeah. Resident Evil. Um, I know it's not going to last because just they, they end up going they're gonna, and done. They're going to get in its own head. Capcom yeah. keeps doing that. Like they make something amazing and people love it. And then they're like, well, what if it was also like this? And then they just make it. <laughs> they just make <laughs> and it. And now we have Resident Evil 6. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they dial it back, right? And then, mm-hmm. you know, they become Cap Good again. And then they become Cropcom again, and then they become Cap Good again, and you know what I mean? So, just for right now, I'm appreciating what Resident Evil 2 Remake is. It's not perfect. There are certain things about the game I'm like, what? But this is the best Resident Evil game in the longest time, probably since 4. Resident Evil Revelations 2 was pretty good, but this is the direction I want them to go with Resident Evil that is realistic. So I'm glad that this is on the list for that reason. Yeah. Moving on on the list, we also have Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. because right. Gotta have a From Software game on there every yeah, year. Yeah, you, you gotta have a Souls game. Yeah. 
And then last one we have on the list is The Outer Worlds, which I, again, I was really surprised to see this game on the list. I've been hearing a lot of good things about it, mm-hmm. and I'm interested in picking it up and giving it a try. Yeah. But none of the commentary that I have been hearing has said this is game of the year worthy. Um, so I, I have been hearing a lot of people raving about the game. I think a lot of it comes from that desire for a good fallout experience which i think people haven't really gotten for several <laughs> entries and bethesda certainly hasn't been giving it to them yeah so. yeah so obsidian making the outer worlds is from what i hear really excellent the writing is very good uh, cliff's been playing it and he's been raving about it and he, has he now yeah cool. yeah he has now Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! He uh he likes the structure of the game too, where it's not necessarily an open world game. It's sort of like a an open world game that was then narrowed and focused down. And honestly, I like that. I don't really care for like purely purely open world games. I like games that kind of go through like a little funnel and then an opening and then a funnel and then an opening kind of pattern. Because yeah. I think that that allows you to boil down your experience and create a bit more of a mm, I don't know not guided but i mean like a more intended experience so you can polish it up and you don't have to worry about variables as much and then you can focus on the experience that you're intending for the player so uh cliff has been talking about how much he enjoys that and i think he's almost at the end of it even it's not like a super crazy long game which is is cool yeah well and from what i've been hearing is that this game definitely has that flexibility of take the path that you want and we'll change the story according to what it is that you say you want to do. So it it not being the longest of game, but still being a very fulfilling game is very reaffirming to hear because it, it encourages that replayability. It's part of the reason why series like fallout and elder scrolls and games like that have blasted as long as they have, even though they haven't come out with new entries in the franchise. Mm-hmm. And no, I'm not talking about the six times that they've re-released Skyrim. So, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's that replayability that really kind of gets to you. And it's nice to know that this is another game that kind of aims for that uh, that asset of it. Yeah. So it's coming out uh, quarter one. On the Switch, so you know, within the first mm-hmm. you know, handful of months on the Switch. So if Which you don't pick it I'm, up on the PS4, you should pick it up on the Switch. Yeah, I'm actually really interested in see how this is going to play on the Switch. Yeah, it runs in ultimate, ultimate, <laughs> unlimited. <laughs> Wait, what? Unreal. <laughs> <laughs> it runs in Unreal Engine Four. Which, ultimate Unreal. <laughs> which is a uh, engine that has native compatibility with the Switch. So theoretically, it should be a little bit easier for developers. And I think it is a pretty good engine that makes really good looking things. Uh, yeah. Destiny Connect was made in Unreal 4. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> but going back and looking at this entire list of selections that they have on here. Yeah. So Control, they have an action RP or an action game. Death Stranding, I would classify that as an action game. Uh, Smash Bros, I'd consider that a fighting game. I- saying death stranding is an adventure game is a little bit closer yeah adventure game yeah Yeah. uh resident evil 2 i would consider an adventure game yeah sekiro i would consider that kind of an action game or an adventure game i would say action because from what i've heard about that game is it is very much a boss rush kind of game yeah it's not it's not as much like the soulsborne games in in level design yeah but I mean, if you're if you're breaking it down into the easiest way to explain it, like saying this is a boss rush game, I don't think there are enough games out oh, no, there. No, no, no. Or... I'm saying it, action game for sure, as opposed uh, to ah, gotcha, game. gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and then Outer Worlds is going to be an RPG. Like in reality, we only have arguably three or four genres uh-huh. that are being represented in this game of the year format. Yeah, I mean. I'm trying to think about the other big sellers and what genres those are, the sports games, none of them are breaking new ground, and honestly, they're for the casual audiences usually. You know? True. So true, I don't think but... that they're very much a celebration of video games, so we're not seeing those. Yeah, but like I would change out control with like Fire Emblem, for example. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would too, but that's also because <laughs> I don't know what control really. I don't know what the hook of control is. 
And I mean, Fire Emblem was so good. They they did so good on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they really. So it was snubbed. Snubbed. Oh my god. <laughs> Clutching the pearls. <laughs> Whatever. I don't uh, care about the award show though. Yeah. And you know what? I with these kind of like big awards, everything needs to be taken with a grain of salt because there's so many like nominees and like backroom dealings to get your name as a nominee on there and yeah, yeah. bribing and it's just it's the entire thing is rigged and if we you can, think I mean, that we it's we can not... speculate on that we don't know for sure but you know you, you can speculate on that because it's an award show yeah absolutely but i mean with how with how successful of an industry video games are i would be shocked to hear that that is not going on uh-huh and I mean, but before we go much further, like, I just want to call out a couple of other, like, weird ones that I saw on this list. Like, uh, best art direction on here. Again, Control and Death Stranding make an appearance, uh, but Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening does? Oh, uh-huh. Uh, I just, I found that very weird to kind of pop up, but it kind of makes sense because it is a very different direction uh graphically than how they've gone with in the past yeah that one doesn't surprise me at all i think that control kind of surprises me because from what i've seen of the game it's not it's not doing anything particularly interesting it's just kind of a mostly realistic game yeah let's see what else do we have on this list uh best score we have death stranding again in that yeah, list yeah that's the but... one that i'm just like come on this is this is bs this sh it shouldn't be nominated in there like Death Stranding's nominated, but uh, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Uh, yeah, exactly. And it's like Ultimate. Like I don't know. It's kind of unfair because Smash Bros. Ultimate is like such a celebration of video games in like so mm -hmm. many different capacities. But like the score, There's so much music from all these different series from Nintendo and outside of Nintendo, and they rearrange all this music. They re-record all this music. It. Ugh. I don't know. And it turns exactly. out so good. Like, what the hell? I can't believe that that's not on there. Like, that right there is a... Uh, Akashi, Akashi, Akashi. What the hell is Akashi in English? Uh, a representation, a proof of <laughs> of this being just BS. Yeah. I do have to admit, I am very happy to see Cadence of Hyrule on this one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Are you telling me that... Uh, uh, no, no, no. Devil I'm May Cry 5 and Kingdom Hearts 3 don't deserve to be No, no, no. I, I mean, who knows? <laughs> but what I'm saying is that Death Stranding does not pull my devil trigger. Oh, I see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One last category I wanted to point out, though, was they have a... Um, an award for an indie game specifically called the Fresh Indie Game presented by Subway. So Subway is telling you what the best game to eat on a sandwich is. This is so stupid. I didn't even see that. My eyes yeah. glazed over before I even got to that part. <laughs> Although with that being said, I see Goose Game is on that list and that game needs to be Indie Game of the Year. Yeah. <laughs> Slice a goose on your Subway sandwich. Why not? Goose sandwich. Honk if you think that this is nonsense. <laughs> press press Y for award. <laughs> so let's move on to our uh, Nintendo predictions for the game awards. I don't really like doing predictions, but a lot of people like to hear about them. So we're doing it for you. Okay. Not you, Galen. Oh. I don't do nothing for you. Oh. I do, I do things specifically not for you. Like not giving you an Oni. Oh, but I want an Oni so bad. Everyone does. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so last year, we got, we got to talk about last year and maybe even the year before. The year before was what, 2017? That was Bayonetta 3 that they tease slash unveiled, right? Mm, yes. And then last year was probably the biggest year for Nintendo making announcements they announced Joker as the DLC character, setting the tone for the entire DLC Fighters Pass. They yeah. unveiled Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 at the Game Awards as well, which came out of nowhere. That wasn't leaked anywhere. It was great. I remember that, yeah. And then there was a whole bunch of other uh, third-party announcements that Nintendo was included in on with announcements from uh, Mortal Kombat 11, 
Crash Team Racing, and then there was also Sayonara Wild Hearts, of course. Yeah, they, that game blew my really... mind when I first saw. It. I was like, "What is this? What is this? I need it! I'm Sailor Moon." <laughs> so, with all of that behind us in terms of history, where do we go with this? Like, okay, so I'm thinking, let's do realistic expectations, and then let's do also for fun expectations. Yeah. Realistic expectations, I think we'll get a new Smash Bros. character announcement. Because even if it's not playable playable images or anything like that, we'll at least figure out who it is. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I think that's one of my realistic expectations. Because though they did it last year, and though the timing is perfectly right and everything is set up for them to announce a new character at the Game Awards... I don't think that Nintendo likes to do the same thing twice, therefore making you expect it the next time and setting a precedent, you know what I mean? No, I, I kind of see where you're coming from on this one. Like, they don't want to be predictable. It wouldn't surprise me either way if they did that, but I know so many people are expecting it and some people are going to be upset, so then it's like, oh, I hope that they just do it just so the people on Twitter just shut up. <laughs> Well, is this going to be the year that they're uh, announcing Gino as a playable character? Honestly, or... I hope so. Shut up. <laughs> I'm one of those, okay? Go ahead. I don't care. I, I know you are. I know you are. You know why? Because then that means that Super Mario RPG lives again. You know what, why? You know what that means? Is that Nintendo and Square Enix working together again. That's what I really want to see, okay? You know what I really want out of this? Okay, we're going to for fun right away. We're pushing everything out of the way. I want to see... <laughs> oh, Jesus. No, shut up. I want to see that nothing gets announced on the Smash character dlc at the game awards then in january when everybody's like frothing at the mouth for their dlc expectations nintendo has a direct and then they announce new games coming to uh the uh super nintendo thing on the super nintendo virtual console what is that called i'm just i'm too excited right now Nintendo Switch Online. yes and then one of those games is super mario rpg and then they're like oh and by the way Gino is coming to Smash. That would be so much fun. And then that would be amazing. Let's just go crazy, Pokeballs to the wall. Then they were like, and there's gonna be a new entry, Super Mario RPG too. Like just show a logo or just whatever. I don't even know. Like make me freaking lose my mind. That will just kill me. It will absolutely <laughs> slay me, and I want that so bad. I want to have a heart attack. Is that before or after they announced that Mother 3 is going to be coming completely translated through the Nintendo Switch Online? Yeah, that'd be nice, but save that for later or something. I don't know. I need a drink. <laughs> uh, going back to the, to the awards, I'm sorry. Go back. Yeah. You know what else I would love to see? Uh, is I would love to see them do an updated trailer on how Metroid Prime 4 is coming along. Is that realistic? Uh, it could be. I can see it going out of way. I don't think that they would do anything like that for the Game Awards. The Game Awards is just like, I would like to see that for fun, for sure, because I love Metroid and I want to see what this fourth entry is going to be. But realistic wise, they have to remember who the audience is at the Game Awards. Lots of people watching don't like Nintendo or aren't interested in Nintendo, along Mm. with people who are interested or are diehards or whatever. So they want to announce something that is a big multi-appeal. And I think that their marketing has been doing a good job of that, at least in the Switch years. So, for example, Bayonetta 3, that's a great one to do. Uh, The DLC for Smash is so-so on paper, but actually just blows people out of the water hype-wise, so it was a good one. (laughs) Marvel Ultimate was a good one as well, because that's a a multi-appealing game. Hmm. So I I don't know if that would be a realistic one. I, I think Metroid would be a good one to announce when they have really concrete gameplay to show off well and even if they showed just like a trailer or something like this here and then they had concrete gameplay to show off at e3 of next year yeah but that's that's hypothetically if it's coming out at the end of next year say true but i mean also people have kind of forgotten that the game is a thing no they have not they have not (laughs) they have not forgotten it they've been upset about it what i do think might be realistic is maybe something on Breath of the Wild 2, just because that's a super hype game. And I think that they're planning for it to come out in holiday of 2020. I mean, of course, that's not announced. Did, I think they said Is that what they said? They said 2020, I think. I thought they said 2021. Oh, really? 
Uh, let me double check. I don't, I don't think that they would have announced here. if they have a release window of 2021. I don't think they would have announced it as a release window of 2021. I think everybody would have been talking about it being like, oh, my God, so far off, that kind of thing. Yeah. So maybe something on Breath of the Wild 2 just because it's the right audience. Maybe we'll see another thing on Bayonetta 3 just because it was announced there two years ago. Mm hmm. I don't know. I'm not actually thinking that any of these are particularly realistic so that's why and by the way everybody going into like hype things like this like first off don't buy into hype yeah i know that we're talking here about video games and that's exciting but just we're talking about being logical here just go into it with like oh maybe they'll do this maybe they'll do that and then just whatever shows up you know whether you like it or not but don't be upset that they didn't show the thing that you specifically were expecting them to launch because y or not launch but show because you just set unexpected real re, uh, realizations. What? Wait, you just set <laughs> unrealistic hey, expectations. I said the words backwards. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> like if nothing comes up on Metroid and I'm like, they didn't show anything Metroid. I'm so upset they didn't do that. It's like you could be disappointed that nothing was shown. But like logically, was there a reason for anything Metroid to very specifically be shown at this particular award show? No, not at yeah. all. <laughs> uh but that said can i say one that i think would be fun yeah no pikmin 4 oh that'd be nice yeah we know it's done miyamoto <laughs> they're just sitting on it yeah pull my pikmin trigger okay does that need a, a mario yahoo <laughs> no that's fine i'm not sure it sounded dirty <laughs> no 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 we keep that in <laughs> I do want to say, though, the only way that I'm going to accept Game of the Year, Death Stranding winning, is if it wins, Kojima goes up on stage, and then Jeff Keighley proposes to Kojima right there on stage. <laughs> that would make me so happy. And proposes with a fetus. Ew. <laughs> so moving on, the last thing we wanted to just sort of touch on is Animal Crossing Pocket Camp is getting a subscription service. It's actually live now. And this is a little bit of a weird one, contentious one, because it's a mobile game, you know, with the mobile monetization schemes. Hey, it, al it allows me to spend more money on fortune cookies. And uh, Mario Kart got its subscription service, monthly subscription service. And everybody's mm. like, what, 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 what? And I, I mean, I agree. I think it's ridiculous. Don't buy that. Also, don't buy these. <laughs> There's two different programs that you can buy. They're both called the Pocket Camp Club. You'll be an exclusive member. Ooh. <laughs> the first one is called the Happy Helper Plan, where you get like a designated caretaker to take care of events and fulfill your requests when you're not doing it. And then you get 60 leaf tickets per month as well. It's $3 per month and it's free for the first month. Then there's the Cookie and Depot plan, where you get members-only fortune cookie shops, and you can get five fortune cookies per month, and you get yeah. more storage space for your warehouse. That's eight bucks a month. And I don't remember what fortune cookies do. I think they give you, like, costumes and some items. I don't remember. They're, they're promotional items that show up. They have, like, a pool of items that you can actually get in it. And they're timed, right? Yes, they're timed. Yeah. Gotta, gotta get that FOMO in there. Yep. And then both memberships come with shorter crafting times and access to some unique journal or something that has articles about your friends in the game. And uh, by friends, I mean the animal friends, the animal characters. And then a first look at new items. So, you know, there's lots of good stuff in it, but it's a subscription service. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, this is bad. I don't like video games doing this because this isn't even yeah. a video game i'm, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later in my additional dlc but mm -hmm. the problem is that i feel like the fan base of people who are still playing pocket camp because this has been out for two years yep. and anybody who's still playing it after that two years is definitely very dedicated towards mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. And it's kind of addicting. Like, I have not played it myself personally, but I have seen my wife play it. You and personally? <laughs> yeah, me personally. <laughs> <laughs> and I can definitely see the appeal. And it's the exact same appeal that Animal Crossing as a franchise actually has. It just reduces it into these bite-sized 
chunks and if you want it faster that's where like the monetization actually comes in and that's a whole different topic for another day yeah but <sighs> i played it when it first came out and i really enjoyed it for i think a month i i think it was the it might have been the longest i played a nintendo mobile game which means any mobile game yeah i played fire emblem heroes quite a bit but then i fell off of it but i think i played animal crossing for a little bit longer just because it was relaxing and fun fire emblem heroes was a little bit stressful yeah i liked it for sure and it wasn't heavy on the monetization and i know that they haven't they had a lot of people download the game it's one of their better uh performing mobile efforts but yeah i i remember i remember there was an article that came out last year about it crossing the like the the 50 million dollar mark as far as like income that it's actually been able, been able to bring in well no so. I, I was actually going to mention that the install base is great but the revenue that they've been making is not great compared to their other efforts yeah so that's why they're probably putting this mobile subscription service in because they have a lot of engagement but they don't have a lot of income coming in there so they recognize that there are opportunities to make money there business wise but like yeah. for the sake of video games as an industry this is bad news and i don't like it you know i don't like subscription services but that is just the new monetization method that everybody loves to go into nowadays you know it's not just for video games it's watching movies getting regular things that you use like razors your amazon purchases everybody wants to do some sort of subscription thing because the mental mm, hurdle that you have to get your consumers over when making a purchase is then gone. It's just one time. And then once you get your consumers to commit to that subscription, then mm -hmm. it's like they only purchase it one time. And then every single month it comes out and it's as if they never purchased it in your consumer's mind. You know what I mean? And people yeah. stick to that way more often than going through the mental hurdle of making the purchase again like ah, do i really want to make this right now and it's just marketing and social sciences and it's fascinating but it's also really gross because it's exploitative well and that's why i've always i've <laughs> i have never really considered the free-to-play games on the same standing as a game that you would go and pay money for to get a finished product all in one go. Yeah, I I agree. I I have reasoning for that, but please continue. Yeah, and it, it's it's not necessarily the correct way of thinking because I do feel that discredits the idea of what a game actually is. But if you are looking at a game as in a business finished product, they are two completely separate things. Uh huh. Because I can, I honestly can make justification of if you have a free to play game, then money that you would put towards the game, if it does get you something that would equal the experience that you would pay for for a finished game, then it is acceptable. The problem I, is uh, that. I, I disagree, well, yeah. but go on. Yeah, well, the problem is that mobile games don't have that limit. So they link this ability to get whatever microtransaction or whatever, you know, time lock released or whatever like that. They put a value on that and say, how many times do you want this? How much is this worth to you to continue on with that enjoyment? As opposed to give us our money, we will give you a full package for you to enjoy it all together. So I agree with you for totally different reasons like your reasoning i don't agree with my yeah. reason that i i think that the majority of mobile games when i say mobile games i mean like the free-to-play structure of gaming is bs and not actually a game is because of the game design when your game and i'm using quotes here when your game the core of it is the monetization structure and how can we make the gameplay loop be about exploiting FOMO in people and giving people a huge list of things to do that are instant gratification and really quick satisfying cute things or fun things or exciting explosive things and then giving them so much to do that they can't keep up with and you know doing the currency bloat thing making things intentionally slightly confusing but just enough so that you've you're fishing people that's what your core experience is and then your game is just window dressing around that that is no longer a game 
the game is the window dressing and that is just a means of exploiting people with addictive personalities or weaknesses to spend money on this and that's why i'm critical of them as games and saying that they well, aren't well and i think you're being critical of the actual finished product itself of the game as opposed to the core concepts of the game itself because no, i'm, I'm critical of both <laughs> well yeah <laughs> but let me say for example uh take mario kart 8 deluxe versus mario kart tour uh-huh. like the gameplay itself is technically the same between them. You are trying to race around and you are trying to get a first place. I mean, the the differences no, between no, them because there's so much there's skill involved in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe and there's not so much skill involved in a mobile game. Like mobile games intentionally are made to be low skill based to keep more people playing. So are you saying that that's what's happening in Mario Kart Tour? Yeah, for sure. How so? From the little that I played, I mean, there's not a uh, like in-depth boosting mechanic. There's boosting, but it's not about hitting the right curves in the right way. Deacceler- deaccelerate? What is this word? Braking. Braking and accelerating at the right time because it's automatically going. And then you're also playing against like fake online people. Like They're all CPUs, you know? So it's mm-hmm. just about doing the experience bar and unlocking items and stuff like that and then the the small gameplay of actually playing as mario kart is familiar enough to you as you're playing through that you're like oh this is mario kart and it's you know it's a fun little thing to play on my phone yeah but you could you could theoretically if you wanted to be this kind of a person you could get a bluetooth controller hook it up to this app and be able to play the game with that way instead of rubbing on your phone but like, i think that the wo- controls itself don't allow itself don't allow don't uh lend itself to being played well on a controller in the same way like if you try that it's not going to feel like mario kart 8 deluxe it, the controls are made differently true true and and I don't want to say that Mario Kart Tour and Mario Kart 8 Deluxe are equal when it comes to the way the games are designed and the and how fine-tuned the game is control-wise and how much freedom it gives to you as a player to be able to play the game. But what we're talking about here is the core concepts of the game itself. And if you were to take away all the graphics, all the user interface and like yeah, what not, is it that I'm this not game is talking about is, visuals. Yeah. But but you, you're saying that because it is a mobile game, then it has less significance because of that, even though the core concepts of what you're trying to do in the game are there. No, no, you're misunderstanding me. I And first off, before I go into this, I wanted to say that we're comparing Mario Karts. It's not like Mario Kart is a super skill-based <laughs> game. The core of Mario Kart proper is playing a game with your friends online or locally and racing you know and and throwing items and wackiness and stuff like that it's not super skill based there are skills that you can do and you can do 200 cc and do crazy stuff and play online but it's mostly about playing with other people and that kind of thing but anyway well and i i would argue against that but continue oh, whatever what, what is mario kart about then huh what what, what is mario kart to you mario kart is a racing game with weird mechanics the fact that it encourages you to play it with friends and that it encourages a more lighthearted atmosphere is a non sequitur so you're you're making me so mad we have to move on okay anyway (laughs) i'm saying that mobile games are not game experiences because i shouldn't say mobile games the free-to-play structure the exploitative one yes ones those are not games because their core intent is to get money out of the player it's about creating a gameplay loop that feels addictive and exploits people that have that weakness and then whatever gameplay is just slapped on as an afterthought you know what i mean and you're saying Sorry, I, <laughs> I I feel like you are demonizing the the free to play format because they want to try to make money, and I'm not. They want to exploit money, not that they want to make money. It's that the entire gameplay loop is made around how can you make money. 
It's the same thing with like Schluter's and now FIFA games and the NBA games. It's about how can we create this uh, gameplay loop for the players to spend money and feel like they need to spend money. It, it's it's an evolution of gaming business essentially. Because I was just about to say, I uh, then want to where would fight you... you right now <laughs> for saying those words? Because that's the excuse that lots of people use. Like it's a necessary evolution. Well, I'm not saying it's necessary. No, 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 you're not saying that. Evolu evolution can go in bad ways. Like I'm, yeah, yeah. I think that the way that they are designing these free-to-play games are wrong. I feel that people are immediately turned off to the entire concept of a free-to-play game or mobile games simply because they don't want to deal with all these hassles. Uh, changing topics a little bit, it's a little bit why when Disney Plus decided to come out as a streaming service, why, you know, half of the people out there decided to completely roll their eyes because I don't want to subscribe to another thing. But it's a natural evolution because that's the way that most people are consuming their media. I hate to play dev devil's advocate on this one, but I can't necessarily blame a business for wanting to try to make money in an evolving environment. Now, I am not going to say that they are doing it the right way, because I don't think they are. Well, I think that that's, the, that's one of the, um, the rooted evils of capitalism, is like, if you give them a way to take, then they will try to take. You know, you give them an inch, they want a foot, or whatever the saying is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that is true. Like, that is a natural way of them doing that. And that's why I don't know what the answer is to this. Like if there needs to be regulations or whatever, does it need to be worldwide reg regulations? Like we had one of our lovely listeners write into us about this. She's living in Belgium and yeah, she can't yeah, play yeah, yeah. the Nintendo mobile games because they're outlawed. Because they consider microtransactions and loot yeah, boxes. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's so many aspects to this. There's not a cut and dry answer to it, but I mean, yeah. yes, like what you're saying, I totally agree with about like, it's a, that's what they're going to do because they can make more money. I don't think it's good. Yeah. I agree with you on that. But I mean, that is what they're always going to do. And that's why I think it's really important. And we're going to roll right into additional DLC because we got to keep moving. But yeah, um, I'm going to share this thing with uh, the additional DLC uh, because it's important, I think, for all of us as and I think that everybody listening to this is like dedicated enough to gaming that you know they listen to the industry they're not just like paying attention to a game that comes out once in a while and of they play course a game. yeah they're clearly dedicated they want to hear about video games and hear video games be talked about so it's important for people like us especially to stay informed and to inform others who are uh, receptive to it when they're receptive to it about these kinds of practices so they don't become a casualty or a snack for these uh for these companies to take money from them you know Exactly. Personally, I'm like, take a stand against microtransactions. Don't spend anything. Mm -hmm. And I feel that is a very good um, moral compass to have for you personally. And I would Me personally. Well, and I would I would support you spreading that message to other people. However, I I feel that de demonizing a game and in this case a mobile game simply because it is a mobile game is a little premature like i feel like it should when you're looking at a game it should look at the overall merits of how does the game actually play on a case-by-case -case basis as opposed to just thinking oh hey this is you know a mobile game this is gonna be trash yeah, like i don't write i should clarify because i agree with you i don't write games off immediately i will definitely be like oh well this is probably what it's gonna be but i will you know take a look at it before i make my actual assumption on it Mm -hmm. And then if I see that, like, oh, it's got all these things that are the telltale signs of exploiting you on money. And it does have all those things. And I'll be like, yep, it's a shame. Yeah. Because there's probably good fun stuff in there. Same thing with uh, Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. There's not, I wouldn't have played that for like a month if it wasn't fun to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? What are you laughing about? No, sorry. Continue. I'll, I'll explain it in a second. I don't want to interrupt you. No, that was it. <laughs> Okay. Well, and this is actually kind of funny because I, I agree with this mentality that you have, but about a different subject. And that subject is fundraisers and Girl Scout cookies for people who try to sell it in a workplace environment. What? How about... Okay, so bear... Wait, no, 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 no. So, Save so... that for next episode because we have to get moving. Well, it, uh, just let me get it in really quick. I know. 
So the reason I bring this up is because I have a personal moral thing that if somebody comes in and says, hey, my kid is selling candy bars or something like that, or they're selling popcorn, would you like to get some? But they are coming into the office that I work at and decide to do that. I will immediately say no, regardless of what it is they're selling, what the cause is or anything like that. Because I have a personal moral belief that corporations are just using these small kids to try to sell their product, only giving them a fraction of what they need and what they're actually trying to raise money for. And even if you were to try to hide behind the excuse of, well, this is a good experience in Girl Scouts, for example, because it gives them life skills for selling and everything. I can't support that because it's the parents who are actually coming in and doing all the work for it. Mm. And I can't support that kind of an attitude. So I understand where you are coming from when you talk about not downloading DLC and things like that. I understand I and I respect... On a, in regards to getting microtransaction in mobile games, then. Yeah, like, I understand and I respect your conviction on this. This entire thing was me trying to give you a compliment and saying that I, I hear you. <laughs> So the bottom line is Oni Dino, a, a human among humans. No, just bottom line, Oni Dino, just period. <laughs> Oni Dino, the best and only podcaster you ever need to listen to. Yes, good job. <laughs> okay, so additional DLC time. So I talked about it a little bit before. I am sharing a disgusting video on YouTube. It is, and I'm... I'm not really apologetic to this guy because he's gross, but I don't know if, how to pronounce his name very well. Probably Irik can help us out. It's a very Scandinavian name. Torolf Jern Jernstrom. He's the CEO of a, I don't know if they're a developer or a publisher. I've never really heard of him, called Tribe Flame. They make mobile games and probably other stuff. He is speaking in this YouTube video at Pocket Gamer Connects Helsinki 2016. He's explaining how to manipulate consumers into spending microtransactions. The talk is actually called Let's Go Whaling. Oh, I've seen this one. Good. Everyone should see this. It is disgusting and it is important to listen to because it's important to learn how insidious this exploitation is and how it's designed into the game. And I think that ultimately it's important for people like us to understand how they do these things and how they think because learning how the opposition thinks is integral to fighting the opposition and staying smart. So I highly recommend this, this listen. Galen, what do you have? So this week I actually have a more thoughtful recommendation. It more is thoughtful the than mine. <laughs> it is the Wisecrack channel on YouTube. Uh, these are guys or a group of guys who get together and talk about different uh, facets of media and specifically the philosophy that we find in them. Uh, they usually stick to more pop culture esque topics. Um, Rick and Morty, South Park, um, The Good Place. Uh, they have, uh, they also deal with video game topics as well. Uh, everything from Red Dead Redemption to Grand Theft Auto all the way over to Pokemon Go. And they specifically call out different philosophy aspects and um, motivations for a lot of these games and how like characters are written and what morals they and messages they're trying to actually give out. So very insightful and very entertaining to listen to as well, like have it on in the background while you're doing other stuff. So, yeah. Nice. So let's move on to the smelliest segment the smelliest i don't know just put in an adjective every time <laughs> i think we can do better than smelliest the most fragrant sure <laughs> it's called listener mail listener mail terrible awful stuff <laughs> galen did you know this did i knew what did you know that we have a, a box, a virtual box, on the internet. I I did know this, actually. Do you know what goes inside that box, that virtual box? It goes the most loving part of this entire program on all of the questions and all of the comments and just the way to Wait, reach out and connect shut to us. Up. 
Hey, you started this. No, I said, do you know what goes in the box? You're supposed to say emails. Oh, what's in the box? <sighs> Once again, just <laughs> disappointing me. Nonstop. And all of our wonderful people listening right now, they can put things in that box. <laughs> they can write emails. I don't know. Can you believe that none of this is scripted, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> And all they have to do is do what, Galen, to put an email into the box? Uh, develop a very terrible B- Brad Pitt impression and send in those emails to Nintendo Everything Pod at gmail.com. That's right, Nintendo Everything Pod at gmail.com. We read every single email that comes through. Some days we don't even get an email. You could be that special Tuesday emailer. Mm hmm. Seriously, send all of your messages on a Tuesday. Sure. <laughs> and if What's you wrote in, in on a Tuesday, Tammy, or Timothy, or Tetra, or Karen, then your God, you suck. <laughs> then your email might sound something like this. So this week we have an email from longtime listener Max. Hey, Max, how's it going? Hey, Max, great to hear from you again. Yeah, it's been a little while. Thank you for writing back into us. So, Max writes in, Hello, gang. It's been a bit. To start, I'm definitely welcome... (laughs) I definitely welcome a spoiler cast to talk about the Pokemon Dex cuts as the new hotness. Granted, there are some absolutely horrifying additions, but there definitely are some cool new critters in there as well. So, we're taking... Max's email in segments because wow did he write so many words. Max, we can't read all of your words on air because we'll be here all day. But <laughs> we both read it all the way through and we love every moment of it. You're such a good writer. I was just talking to Galen before the show and I was like, is this just the way that he writes? Because it's it feels like a stream of consciousness, <laughs> but it's written so well that I'm like, are you just like a great writer? Jealous. Yeah. I especially like all the Pokemon that you called out specifically on Pokemon that you personally would like to see in, uh, Pokemon that you are very excited to bring over to uh, to the new game. Uh, I actually want to call out this part that you wrote. You really hope that Pokemon Home doesn't take as long to launch as Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon to include the Pokemon Bank functionality. Yes. Because I'd really like to have your competitively trained Pokemon come in, including your five perfect IV ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know what? If you have one of those, kudos, because that sounds like it's a pain to get a hold of. I can't imagine the amount of effort that has to go into that. Well, and you're talking, that's the reason why, you know, bringing Pokemon across generations are, you know, you can build on that experience over the generations, so. So let's break it up into that. We're going to talk about Pokemon Sword and Shield, uh, Pokemon that are cut and new Pokemon. Mm -hmm. So if you are sensitive to that, then we're going to just have you skip ahead. And I will put this in post to what amount of time you should skip right away to future Oni. Can you please right here now say something? Konnichiwa. Jikan ryokousha no Oni Dino to moshimasu. Please skip ahead to about 1 hour 48 minutes in to avoid the light Pokemon spoilers. Mata ne. I am Future Oni. Stop it, you're not Future Oni. I know what he sounds like and you are not Future Oni. How do you know I am from the future? So you're you're from right now and it sucks. <laughs> Cause now sucks. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the Pokemon that have been cut and some of the new Pokemon that we enjoy. Right off the bat, I like Grookey's third form, Rillaboom, where he's got the little Donkey Konga. Oh, that is so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Per- personally, of the starters, he is probably a tied favorite from Scorch Bunny's favorite, or uh, Score Bunny's final evolution. Mm. I don't know. It's just there's something about like the sleek nimble yet a little bit powerful like um oh god what's the uh what's the one that was the chicken the chicken yeah there there was there was the fire chick that turned into like the fighting oh torch chick t- yeah tor- what whatever torch chick finally evolves into it's yeah. very reminiscent of that form. yeah yeah i 
I don't really care for that form though because it's just too humanoid for me. You know, I don't know. A little too basic, maybe. Yeah, it's not very inventive, and like Rillaboom is at least like very gorilla-like, and he's got you know he's got a little prop, and that's cool. I wish that his leaf thing was way more like his mane or whatever he's got going on. I wish it was an afro. That'd be great. <laughs> that would be a lot of fun or it like changes depending on uh the gender of the pokemon like oh, one gender yeah. has the mane and the other has an afro like yeah, that that, would, that be would be pretty cool uh i like square bunny's second evolution though because it looks like knuckle joe with yeah with the little like the thing over its mouth yeah yeah i like that uh i have to be honest i am not uh I am not impressed by Sobble's evolutions. Either am I. They're just too boring. Mm -hmm. It's it's very basic, very streamlined, if you will. Yeah. But moving on to the bug Pokemon, Dotler is a cutie. <laughs> I I had a feeling like that one would kind of like uh, strike out at you. Yes. And I'm very glad that they also included Charge a Bug, the little. <laughs> a little, uh, what is he, like a little bus? I love that. Remember when that came out with Sun and Moon and everybody was going nuts over it on the internet? Oh, I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as far as new Pokemon go, I am a particular fan of Nicket and yeah. its evolved form of Thievil. Because... Don't like the evolved form, though. I love the evolved form. I no. love, like, the damper little, like, gentleman thief fox no, idea. No. Like, that is amazing. Uh, you know who is also amazing is my best boy Yamper yeah, and yeah. his evolved form. Yeah. His like, evolved form is nice. When I start playing this game, that is going to be in my main team. I don't care whatever meta thing is going along with that. Boltund is my best boy. Yeah. You know, I have been thinking about, why don't I just have cats? Like just all cat Pokemon. Like, that's all I need. <laughs> you could probably do it. <laughs> and the same thing with like, you know how I don't like a lot of evolved forms, but I like a lot of the younger forms. Just keep the mm -hmm. younger forms. Don't even screw with the evolved forms. Yeah. Uh, there was another one. It was basically the Geodude of this generation. The Geodude of this generation. Yeah. It's a uh, Roly Coley. Which Ooh. evolves into Colossal. And I don't know. I just, I kind of like it. Huh. It's it's a little weird and a little awkward, but I'm I'm okay with that. Oh, I see it now. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. like its design. I do like its design. Plus, if I remember correctly, I think that Colossal actually has a uh, Gigamax uh, form. Carcoal just looks like a heap of trash. <laughs> it looks like it just came out of the garbage. <laughs> hot garbage yeah yeah i know a lot of people are are kind of like what is going on with the the galler meowth i love it <laughs> i love it i i gotta call out applin because that you were literally just an apple oh what? yeah that one's so precious it's a perfect little <laughs> organism uh alchemy of course is great too like yeah. we've we've talked about that. Like I like Wulu and Alchemy and uh, Grossafleur or whatever it was called. Um, th those are good designs. Oh, my favorite design is the dark fairy type that they have in here called Impidimp. Just because oh, I love yeah. that name. <laughs> yeah, the name is good. Ah <laughs> uh, man, I like that the second form of uh, Applin is like a dragon that pops out of the apple. And is it flying? I can't tell. I mean, I know that the type isn't flying, but it looks like maybe it's flying. But I can't tell, like, it busted out of its shell, you know? Yeah. But I, I like that design. It's it's fun. It's creative. That That's what I want Pokemon to be. Not just, like, yet another humanoid, fast-running bunny thingy. You know what I mean? Exactly. Um kind of switching topics a little bit yeah. uh some of them that are not making their way in here yes i'm i'm actually kind of surprised that geodude didn't make one or make an appearance yeah in this well yeah because i mean you figure as far as pokemon to come over that at least everybody has because it's been in so many different games you would have thought that that would have been one to make the cut uh i guess I don't know. I'm I'm more surprised about like Psyduck, and then of course Golduck not coming over. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, I, if I remember correctly, a lot of the legendaries aren't coming over. But I, again, yeah. I still subscribe to the belief that they are going to be coming over. It's just a matter of different events and different different things to like really broadcast that they're coming over and just do an update later on the fact we should mention that we do have on our website a thing about uh, there are additional pokemon from that are not in the galar pokedex that are found in the data mining for pokemon sword and shield and that mm-hmm. includes something that max was talking about where he's like why is charizard in but um or charmander in them in but not the other two starters. Bulbasaur and Squirtle. The other two starters are found in the data and they're presumably going to be added in later on, like you said, Galen. Yeah. Yeah. I I feel like there's a lot about this game that we just don't know just yet. Eh. Also, I can't believe I forgot to mention Mr. Mime and Mr. Rhyme. So British. I'm shocked though. Like, And correct me if I'm wrong, I don't see any kind of Mary Poppins-esque uh, Pokemon? I need a Mary Poppins Pokemon. You need a Mrs. Mime? Not a Mrs. Mime. <laughs> I need like a Jepa Jepa Poppins or whatever they call them. I don't know. How do they come up with these names? Can, can you, can, can I get another take on that? Please Never. say that again. Not even once. <laughs> I don't even understand what words you just said. Um, speaking of cut Pokemon, however, I am just now noticing that None of the ones from, I think, Pokemon Black and Pokemon White actually made their way over. Uh, that, as that's far where as, like, I really starters. get hazy on them. I'd never play Black or White. Uh, I, I might be getting my generations wa- wrong, but it is uh, Sneevil, uh, whatever the Fire Pig one uh, is, and the... No, that one is... Uh, that's like was that Diamond X and Y? And Pearl. Oh, Diamond and Pearl? Okay. Yeah, because that, that, that was a <laughs> game that I played for sure. I always get mine all like confused when it comes to like it's what came out on what generation. Know, what is this? The eighth generation? It's super hard, yeah. But like even even in uh X and Y, like those starters didn't make the cut either. Yeah, yeah, that is kind of surprising too, because X and Y were a big step for the series because it was the first one on on new Actually, hardware. Looking at this list. I don't think any of the previous starters actually made their way over, with the exception of Charmander. <laughs> the, the incredulity in your voice is just two times larger than it needs to be, and I'm loving every moment of it. <laughs> uh, fuck <laughs> you. <laughs> I don't feel super strongly about a lot of different Pokemon, so I'm not too sad about a lot of the ones not coming over. Yeah, it is, I mean, it is sad, like on a general level, for sure. It, it's nice to know that we'll be getting them later down the line, and hopefully, no, 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 with no, 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 the no. stop right there, we aren't getting them later down the line. There are a select few that are probably going to come out later down the line, but the very, very vast majority of these ones that are currently cut are not coming over. I was talking more long term in regards to like future games because that was their into- that was their entire excuse for making these cuts because they wanted to try to like phase some out, phase some back in and like yeah. give each type of pokemon their time in the sun. But can you imagine if you wait for that next generation or whatever it is and that pokemon that you care about still isn't in it? Like Oh, know, it's absolutely. Be, it's going to be kind of sucky for them. Yeah, but I mean, I'm really hoping that the the kickback from all of this is going to be enough for them to realize that, hey, maybe we should put everybody back in there because this was a huge thing the last time we tried this. Yeah, but this game did just sell like crazy gangbusters. This is the best debut that a Switch game has ever had. This is the it's second a... best selling Pokemon game in the series, and it is the number one most uh, profitable one because of the higher price tag. So this game was super successful. Is this going to continue on like that, or is this just that initial push of sales? Only time will peek a tell. Aww. Wait, is there a clock Pokemon? Oh, surely. Uh, okay. Anyway, let's get back to this email. Oh, Pokemon Home speculation. Yeah, uh, we don't know anything about it. I expect us to know something about it, like in January, February, maybe, with a direct or something. They're definitely yeah. going to be doing, like... How are you enjoying Pokemon Sword and Shield? And yeah. uh, we have 
to announcements for Pokemon Home and Pokemon Sleep and what was the other one? Pokemon Muscle? I don't remember. Uh, Max actually says in his email that he fears that the Pokemon Home Im- implementation. Uh, implementation. Wow, that's not a word. Yep, keeping what? it all in. <laughs> <laughs> them bringing pokemon home to this game isn't necessarily going to happen until late march of 2020 yeah honestly i'm kind of in agreement with that Agreed. yeah if not later like i'm thinking june even because what even is the point when it's a locked down decks i mean of course you can bring in the ones that are in the decks that you've been training forever but yeah there's no rush exactly like if they're if they're standing by this mentality of we want the Pokemon in this generation in this game to really kind of shine through and have its moment, I see them not having any incentive to bring over these that will kind of like defeat the purpose because that's what'll happen. Like as soon as yeah. Pokemon Home comes through, yeah. there's not going to be any reason to recatch those Pokemon in this game unless there's I don't know a particular egg move or something like that and. Even then, that's got to be something that they got to, they have to address because they've specifically cut moves from this game that was in the previous uh, games as well. Yeah, yeah. And while you can bring a Pokemon with that move over to it, you're not going to be able to use the move. So it's like you're getting a, a shadow of what this Pokemon used to be. For example, I have a Snorlax that I got back when I was playing. You told like five uh, stories about this Snorlax, yes. <laughs> Heart Gold or Soul Silver, and I got it from the little uh, Pokedometer or whatever you want to call it—the thing that you actually carried around with you. Mm. Hatching it from an egg, it had the move Self Destruct, mm. and I have absolutely loved this Pokemon this entire time, and I would love to continue on using it. I wish but... it had Surf, so you had a Surfing Snorlax. Oh, that would be amazing! Just like the surfing Pikachu. Ah, <laughs> uh, that would be really cool. But yeah, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to bring that over because it's such a niche move to have on this on this uh, Pokemon, and there is only one way you can get that l- legitimately. So I very highly anticipate a direct coming out where they're gonna be like, "Oh, here's here's the." roll out of content for pokemon and also pokemon blah 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 apps yeah tell me about pokemon sleep (laughs) exactly and moving on moving on max continues to write on also since you were talking about looter shooters recently uh warframe has a big update coming out called old blood that will add some new procedurally generated foes that are a bit inspired by shadow of mordor's nemesis system also vampire cats that can revive you max then goes on to talk about a couple of new features um we're a little bit short on time so we'll we'll maybe come back and talk about those a little bit later but um i'm actually really kind of excited to hear a nemesis system coming into this game yeah i think that that sounds really exciting i'm surprised that you are not super into warframe galen you you would think that I would be. I feel it has something to do with the free-to-play mentality of the game that kind of threw me off when I first got started on it. Um, Also, the first time that I really got introduced to the game was when I picked up my PS4 and I had a lot of other games to play at that time. So I think it just kind of like got moved to the side for me. Mm. And then I never just like struck back into it. (laughs) But from what I heard, it's been pretty fun. I know you've been talking about um, you've had fun with it on the Switch previously yeah yeah when it first came out i downloaded it because i heard really good things about it and that the monetization wasn't super overbearing and when i played it i was like oh this is so much fun i'm really enjoying it and it the switch port looked really good too and then i realized that i had been playing it wrong i was playing it kind of slow and like kind of the way i do with like (laughs) resident evil 4 where yeah. it is an action game, but I'm playing it slow and I'm sneaking up on enemies and everything like that. And then I realized, like, no, you're supposed to be, like, zooming through places. And it is it is a schluter where you are constantly trying to get better weapons, better equipment or whatever the hell. And then I was like, oh, oh, um, darn, it's not for <laughs> me, you know? No, no thank you. <laughs> it, yeah, like, I mean, I don't know. It just... I don't know how to say it because I I did have fun, but I was just playing it in my own way. But then like playing online with people was like totally different. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, And this is a heavily online experience. I'm not very much of an online guy. 
Yeah. 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 So I didn't stick with it, but I just heard so many good things about this game and like, congratulations to that team, especially turning around the game because I heard when it first launched, it was just garbage. And now it's like next to unrealized, unrecognizable. Unrecognizable. Just like with uh, Final Fantasy, was it 14? And I think that might be part of the reason why I like I played it back when it was like first launching and whatnot. Oh, so I think that then yeah, might you should have try been why. Yeah, I mean, Vampire Cats. Let alone Max is doing a great job. I know selling this to us. <laughs> I love vampires and I do love cats. I do love I do love cats. You do love shooters. Give or take. I do love shooters. Wait, you don't like vampires? Vampires are amazing. Vampires are like all right. Vampires are like amazing and sexy and also a perfect parallel with like minorities and like gays. It's amazing. <laughs> My favorite vampires are the ones from What We Do in the Shadows. So Yeah, yeah, those are fun. Those are fun. Did you ever watch the uh the TV show that they made of that? No. It's pretty good. Mm. I recommend it. I, I like it my is additional DLC. <laughs> I like my vampires Spoopy. I don't know. Sexy. So sparkly. Not sparkly. That guy looks <laughs> like a foot. So Max continues on. Meanwhile, there's been some talk of censorship as of late. I think a certain facade of concerning trolling about ethics in gaming journalism can finally totally be waved away uh, by the gleeful schadenfreude expression at Kotaku and the rest of Gizmodo Media suff- uh, suffering pressure from their owners what with the purge at Deep Spin or is that yeah Deep Spin Dead Spin the sense, well in even that he like n- misspelled it <laughs> what no it says Dead Spin right there uh, D-E-A-D-P-S-I-N oh what the- yeah uh, you can cut that out. Don't worry. <laughs> no, I'm leaving it all in. I'm leaving it all in <laughs> with, because you're out of the loop. With the purge at Deadspin and censoring posts about the autoplaying ads being so very bad. Yeah, so let's talk, you know, very briefly just because I'm not super informed on this, but I do know that, like, what has been happening with the Gizmodo group, which is like Kotaku, io9, Deadspin, they. Mm-hmm were recently bought their parent company gizmodo was bought out by another company i don't remember who since then the writers and the workers at those respective publications have been butting heads heavily with the new management and the new management has been been very restrictive and kind of that that's exactly what you don't do with journalism is um restrict what they can write about and specifically i think with deadspin they were like just talk about sports but deadspin is not a publication that talks exclusively about sports and they've never been that they've been ones that have branched out and i think that that's what has made them so successful that's why cliff reads them uh cliff is a huge sports guy so he really enjoys their publication so it's just not only is it incorrect in a journalistic way it's also incorrect in terms of which publication you're talking to And so we've been hearing about a lot of people either getting fired or leaving out of solidarity from some of these publications. And some of the future is a little bit unknown for some Mm -hmm. of them. I haven't really been following it just because I'm not a regular reader of any of those publications. But Max does mention, yeah, like it, it, it can be totally waved away by the gleeful schadenfreude expressed at Kotaku. They don't actually care about like censorship. They don't actually care about, well, I shouldn't say everybody, you know, just some people, the, the really loud mouthed ones. They don't care about that kind of stuff. What they care about is them being right and that their team won. You know what I mean? And yeah. if they're like, oh, Kotaku's getting, you know what I mean? And it's the same thing with like so much stuff with politics lately too, where it's like, you don't actually care about like the principle of like matter A, B, and C. You just care about your team won and their team lost and you were mm-hmm. right. You know what I mean? And Yes. Awesome on you, Max, for pointing this stuff out because you are absolutely right. Yeah. And you know what? I'm really glad you kind of brought this up. Uh, This was actually something that I have not been focusing on all too much myself. Uh, I've always felt like it has been more just kind of like what you were saying on it has been more clicky in regards to, hey, my team won. And it's just like, I don't want any part of this. But it does have greater implications on how people 
talk about video games in this kind of an environment. So yeah. it's good things to keep in mind. Yeah, and I, I think you know Max bringing this up is great because I think it's really important to point out the hypocrisies and you know expose these kinds of things because then hopefully some people will be introspective about that and be like, oh, you're right. You're right. I was yeah. being really gross and really shitty and you know, I'm going against what I was preaching before. And then hopefully they'll be introspective and learn to be better. I mean, that's what happened to me. Like, I'm sure I was a jerk before about certain things and Galen don't say anything. And <laughs> now I try and think, you know, I'm, I'm only human. We're all only human. So we're all making mistakes where we, all the places, but when you realize like, Oh, I'm being a person that I don't want to be. I need to be a better person for myself. I want people to point out my hypocrisies or whatever. And so I think pointing out these, these kinds of things are really important for hopefully the good people that will, you know, get smarter. Yeah. So Max rounds out the email by saying, and on that cherry thought, congratulations on a year of podcasting and good luck in the next year of talking Nintendo. Thank you, Max. Thanks, Max. And thank you for the congratulations. The year of podcasting wouldn't have been possible without you as a listener, Max, and you, every single person listening right now. So thank you all so much for your support. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Here's to another year of us doing this. Yeah, a, another year of me making bad jokes to you. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> please keep supporting us and please, you know, share the show with new people that haven't listened to it before and might be interested in it. And please help us grow because that's how we keep doing this. Yeah. Now, on that note, Max did have a PS sent at the bottom of this email, too. Oh, my God, a postscript. A postscript. On the super serious side of things, I do think you downplayed a bit on the violent origins of the construction of the colonial Hong Kong and its current vast wealth uh, disparity and or how the extradition laws that were a response to the wealthy Hong Konger murdering his girlfriend on the mainland and then fleeing back to Hong Kong or the fact that the National Endowment for de Democracy doesn't really care about democracy and just wants to defend capitalism. But that's a bit of an incendiary of the topic. Thank you, Max, for bringing that up. And you yeah. are super right on all accounts. We, <laughs> we did downplay that. We didn't, we didn't intentionally mean to downplay it, but we didn't mm -hmm. talk about it a whole lot. Yeah. Because I, like, I did edit it down a bit in post as well. Because, mm -hmm. as you said at the very end, and you are right, it is a bit of an incendiary topic. So, Absolutely. As you can tell from the episode, there wasn't a whole lot of back and forth on it. And Galen, I don't want to speak for you, but um, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you did mention that you kind of felt uncomfortable sort of talking about it because you didn't feel like you were super knowledgeable about it. And I'm not super knowledgeable about it either, but I mm -hmm. did just want to talk about what I did know just to keep people informed. Yeah, I felt like I felt like it was very much a a tonal shift away from what we normally talk about on this show. And I I do believe that certain listeners do come in and some people do come listen to us as an escape from these kind of environments and uh, that kind of a thing as well. And I didn't want to do a disservice to the gravity of the situation by, you know, our regular tone of, like, making jokes on the situation and things like that, and I, I felt like it was a much more serious talk than we could give it credit for. Yeah, and, you know, I'm fine with getting serious on the podcast from time to time, too, so, I mean, that's why mm -hmm. we talked about it, that's why we kept it in the show, but... Yeah, I, I do want to keep things like fairly light here, but I do want to get serious from time to time when when situations arise, like the situation with like Blitzchung and Blizzard being ridiculous, just because it is a good opportunity to get people who who may not have heard about this situation a little bit more involved. And I think, you know, it's a great opportunity to do that. So I think it is slightly responsible as a human of as a human of the universe and of mm -hmm. this planet to try and inform people as well so it's a delicate balance and we're still trying to figure it out and yeah um anybody listening uh 
give us your feedback on like anything that we're talking about when we get too serious or too silly or not enough this or too much of that or whatever or if something is great you know give us this wonderful feedback just like you're giving us max um because it helps us to shape the show and make it a little bit better absolutely because i do want to talk about serious stuff i want to talk about all kinds of stuff on here this is not (laughs) solely a video game podcast podcast this is a primarily video game podcast primarily nintendo but i want to talk about everything everything Mm -hmm. we can nintendo everything (laughs) see see so send in your life advice questions tell tell me about your weird awkward stages in life that you're having as a 16 year old or whatever and uh we'll try and tell you what advice we can give you as people who were once 16 and are now older than that twice as old oh god (laughs) what do you want to be 16 again that sucked i'm so sorry to any 16 year olds listening I think we mostly have older <laughs> listeners, though, which makes sense. I mean, the way that we talk and everything. I would not mind going back in time and reliving certain aspects if I could keep the knowledge that I currently have. Yeah, yeah, sure. Who wouldn't? Could be fun. Just like Chrono Trigger. You can go back and beat Lavos. And turn everybody into lizard people. So you guys listening right now, you. Yeah, you, you listening right now. If you haven't written in right now, what's your problem? <laughs> yeah. you're not backing me up too much on this caitlin nope this is all you you're (laughs) taking all the ire and heat for this we want to hear from you nintendo everything pod at gmail.com yep nintendo everything pod at gmail a dot to com why why that why 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 not why not zoidberg so what's coming up what's coming out i don't know what word i just said on the pod nintendo everything dot com oof we got some interview stuff coming up talking about darksiders might be out already we also have some smash bros stuff that i'm translating from famitsu and lots more good stuff you know we got it every week all the time nintendo everything.com stay connected to us on twitter that's at nin everything also the youtube youtube.com slash nin everything and then me Oni Dino, aka the best, po- the only podcaster in the world. Uh, at, oh god, <laughs> at Twitter. No, wait. Shit. Uh, at Oni underscore Dino on Twitter. Oni underscore underscore Dino on Instagram. And then my YouTube with my husband Cliff. Game married. G a y m e married on YouTube. Playing some Luigi's Mansion and some other stuff this week. I don't even know what it is. Even I don't know what it does. Galen, <laughs> what do you do? Well, I am on Twitter talking with the folks at Mobius087. And I am on Instagram posting pictures of my cat that I have taken during this very recording. <laughs> he doesn't pay attention. <laughs> I get distracted by cats very easily. But you can also look at those pictures of cats on my Instagram at true underscore mobius the only place on the internet that you can see pictures of cats yes to be fair though my cat is pretty cute she is yeah she was wearing a little sweater and everything it's really cute oh she's got a little sweater oh my god her yeah. mama she knitted it for her it, she, she did and you know what it she she needs it because she has no hair except for the little fuzz on her face and the little fuzz on her feet oh she's got the little fakakta fuzzes all over her little feetsies does that one need the Mario sound effect? No. Yahoo! No. <laughs> the only way I could talk about that is if I had a I had to schlep all the way over to the... <gasps> it's not coming out. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm tired. Boy, did I say that this was going to be a short episode. I was right, wasn't I? You Shut cursed up. it. You cursed it. So you get bonus time. Woo, bonus time. Listen to us. That sucks. That's like punishment time. <laughs> That's like you're a, uh. an enemy in Bayonetta. And Bayonetta's got you running on the on the little treadmill and she's whipping you a whole bunch and then you run into the guillotine. You know, I'm I mean, Bayonetta in this analogy. Awesome. Am I the treadmill? <laughs> <gasps> I just remembered I had a dream. Oh my god, how did you segue from that? I'm very I just afraid. remembered I had a dream last night where I was dressed up as Bayonetta. I just remembered this. I 
I have no words. Are you imagining it? Me, Is that what's happening? You have left me speechless. No words. <laughs> Good. <laughs> You've killed me. Good. <laughs> so check out what stupid stuff Galen is going to finally say next week on Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> next time on Nintendo Everything Podcast. That's not how he sounds. No, but it was fine. So we'll see you next week. Until then, for everything Nintendo. Stay tuned to Nintendo Everything. Bye-bye. Adios, everyone.